It's stage 17, the final day in the Alps, and suddenly this tour is the most fascinating one we've seen since the centenary edition of 2003. For very different reasons, though. That was a battle between acknowledged giants of cycling. This could see the biggest outsider to win the tour for half a century. Now, understandably, it's the drama on the slopes of La Tussuire yesterday that's garnering all the headlines. But the source of the excitement can be traced back to the fine print of a slow, almost soporific Saturday afternoon. In the baking heat of the massive Centrale on stage 13, the yellow jersey was weighing heavy on Floyd Landis. He didn't like the media obligations that went with it. All the way, everyone looked to his phone act team to control the race. So when a break went containing nobody higher than his old teammate, Oscar Pereiro, 46th in the standings and 28 minutes 50 down, Fonak had an idea. Let this nobody take the lead for a few days. He could wear the jersey like a body double to distract the cameras, ease the pressure on Landis, and the race favourite could take it back for good in the Alps when it mattered. The other contenders' teams evidently concurred. Nobody chased, and by the end of stage 13, had given Pereiro 30 minutes and nine seconds. The French press howled its disapproval at such disrespect for the Mayo Jaune. But when Landis duly called in his loan on stage 15 to Alpe d'Huez, even the critics gave him the benefit of the doubt with the benefit of hindsight. Yeah, I was sure it was a good decision at the time. I didn't need hindsight. With his speciality, the time trial, coming up the day before Paris, all Landis had to do was defend. But on the final climb to La Tussuir yesterday, all his defences crumbled. Landis is cracked, Phil. Landis well. is going off the back. When the yellow jersey cracks, the other big names quickly capitalise. But when Andreas Clurden, Cadell Evans and Carlos Sastre checked to see who'd made the final cut, they saw Oscar Pereiro, the man they'd all gifted half an hour to last Saturday. The race favourites had succeeded in getting rid of the leader, but none of them would be taking over. How the pressure point in this race has shifted as yesterday the yellow jersey was wrenched from Landis's shoulders. I wonder if Oscar Pereira lay awake half the night wondering how on earth it came to pass. And as fate would have it, by the way, Landis and Pereiro shared the same hotel. Difficult to know, in fact, who was the more bemused, the punters watching on or the man in yellow who emerged blinking into the sunlight. Oscar, one question. What can you expect today? I don't know. Only things go to race and uh, after... It's possible to speak a little more. Defend, 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 though, maybe. Yes, it's normal. Uh, today is the last day on the mountain, and uh, it's, it's sure the thing is worth two limits, and uh, I, I like the finish as well for, for us. Well done. Good luck. Oh, Thank you. Sorry. Then his former team leader and yesterday morning's race leader appeared seconds later all in grey, but still smiling and still ambitious. Thank you. Well, you can have another go today, maybe an attack. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Nothing else to lose, eh? Give it, a, give it another go. Yeah, I'd like to win a stage. I'll try today and not. I'll try in the time trial, see what happens. The applause on his way to the team bus clearly adding a skip to his painful steps. But it was Pereiro's bus which pulled out first on their way down to the start. So with Landis eager to go on the offensive, Pereira desperate to defend what he's got and a handful of other riders keen to make up time, this stage is going to be restless and breathless. And with a heart rate readout looking pretty much like this, five serious spikes before the fast downhill finish to Morzine, the toughest climb being the final one, the Col de Juplan. All the more reason for Oscar Pereira to savour the rollout in the neutral zone before kilometre zero. Now, with 11 men of no particular significance out front on the first climb, the Col de Saisie, Floyd Landis ordered his men to the front of the peloton and wound up the pace. Oscar Pereiro couldn't stay with it, and soon there was a bunch containing all the other contenders and Landis. Soon after that, it no longer contained Landis either, because he attacked off the front. With 127 kilometres and five climbs still to ride, it looked like the move of either a desperate man or Superman. Clurden, Sastre, Evans and company decided it was the former and rode a steady pace, allowing Oscar Pereiro to rejoin them as Landis disappeared into the distance in search of the breakaway group. And after some excellent descending, he joined the escape group and set about eradicating his eight-minute deficit on Oscar Pereiro. Pereiro, meanwhile, was asking for help in chasing him down from the likes of Carlos Sastre and getting absolutely nowhere. CSC and Team Mobile were either confident in their calculations of just how much time they could pull back on the final climb of the Juplan, 
or they were playing a dangerous game with everyone's chances. Either way, only Kester Palm were doing any work on the front, while Landis, not content with joining the breakaway group, rode away from it with only Andreas Klerden's teammate Patrick Sinkovitz for company. Not that Sinkovitz was working with Landis, just marking him. We are now on the lower slopes of the Col de Juplan, or at least the riders that the leaders are. Floyd Landis and Sinkovitz have started. I think that was the capture of Christophe Lemavel. I don't know where he was. He wasn't even placed over Chatillon. But now we've got Jens Voigt making it. as though That was Algon who's gone down the back. So there's only two riders now. It's two men versus the rest as they climb the Col de Juplan. Well, to analyse this race, as far as I'm concerned now, all that Floyd Landis has to do, Phil, is climb 12 kilometres, because over the 12 kilometres, that's the only chance that he's really got of losing any time at all, because on the descent from the summit of Juplan down into Morzine, the way this man goes downhill, they're not going to pull anything back at all. The leaders of the Tour de France now have got 11 kilometres to try and put things to rights. I'm not sure they can. We're going to see a big fight. We're going to see the men who have made this Tour de France, Cadell Evans, uh, Andreas, uh, Andreas Cloden, and uh, Carlos Sastra, maybe Cyril Dessel. They are going to have to attack. Denny Menchoff, who's cracked in the last couple of days, they're going to have to attack at the bottom, forget the peloton, and try and reduce the lead of Landis. Carnage on the Juplan is about to happen. Then Floyd Landis is back in with a chance, and he's popped off Patrick Sinkiewicz here. The man from T-Mobile has sat on his wheel for the last 100 kilometres, and now this man from the United States of America lives now in San Diego. Floyd Landis has gone off on his own, and he's now flying away to the probable stage victory and more than likely riding himself back into the possibility of winning the Tour de France this afternoon. He looks back casually there to see, what have I done? Well, I'll tell you what, Floyd, you've cracked Sinkiewicz, and now you're riding on your own. These are the riders who can't stick the pace in the room. The kitchen's got a little bit warm right now as they start to split up. This is a horrible Heimer, fight. Leipheimer, Leipheimer. Levi Leipheimer, the hero of yesterday for much of it, has also uncoupled at the back. The riders are falling away here. At the moment, the last man we saw at the front was Giuseppe Garini. T-Mobile seemed to have a great team. George Hincapi also finding the pace is getting a little bit hot for him. Everybody slowly getting popped off the back. One boy one. This is Frank Schleck now trying to drag Carlos Sastra. There is the yellow jersey just a little bit further back. He's out of the saddle. He hasn't got the acceleration. He hasn't got the jump to come across here. Carlos Sastra knew this afternoon that if he wanted to win the Tour de France, he had to get time on everybody else. At the moment, he's gapping Cloden. He's gapping Menshov. He's gapping the yellow jersey. The yellow jersey, Phil, has lost. Lost the power. The yellow jersey, I think, is riding behind Cyril Dessel, who's fourth overall just now. Michael Bogart is going forward, but he needs to take with him Denny Menchoff, and he can't. Menchoff can't respond. I think Menchoff, we can start a discount now with Sastra, and this is a fabulous piece of riding by the Luxembourger on the front. Carlos Sastra, who was really becoming the number one favourite to win, has been put on the defensive here, not to mention the Mayo Jean, who is also slipping, but hanging just... Well, this is the steep part of the climb. It levels out a fraction once we get into the middle of this climb. But then again, it is savage when you get to the top field. 10% at the summit of the climb. We've gone over four climbs of the day. Frank Schleck today sacrificing himself for Carlos Sastra. Sastra started the day a minute and 50 seconds down in the overall classification. But that was not counting the great ride done this afternoon. This is now Carlos Sastra out on his own. Sastra has now got to go it alone. Schleck is giving him a launch pad, has no more left in him. It's now up to Sastra to ride this mountain alone and for the moment be best of the rest. There could be a yellow jersey awaiting Sastra. Right now there is, if he can continue to progress. Remember, the record is seven different leaders. The next leader, if it's Sastra, will be the eighth. Well, Sastra needs to make a minute and 50 seconds over Oscar Pereira. He starts the day in second place. Cadell Evans there scurrying across the gap. He's onto the wheel, I think, of Christophe Moreau. Again, the reaction's coming. Everybody scrambling, now, Phil, to keep in the race. One thing was right. We knew the peloton would implode on this climb. It's an act of desperation. These riders now have been thrown into all sorts of problems by Floyd Landis. The man that they counted for dead yesterday has come right back into the Tour de France. Carlos Sastra on the climb of the Col de Juplan needs 50 more seconds to be the leader of the Tour de France. He has dropped the yellow jersey by a minute. He is closing in on Floyd Landis, uh, but not alarmingly so. 
This rider for France, Christophe Moreau, is putting up a great performance, isn't going to affect the destiny of anything. And poor Marcus Fulton here has been dropped by that group. He's held that white jersey for so long. Damiano Cunigo is now looking to wear it tonight. The Juplan is having a great say in the Tour de France. Well, let's try and figure out just exactly where everybody is on the slopes of the Juplan. The way the race looks at the moment, Floyd Landis is leading Patrick Sinkiewicz by four minutes. Carlos Sastra is at five and a half minutes. Christophe Moreau is at five minutes and 50 seconds. And the yellow jersey group is still hovering at around about six minutes and 30 seconds. They are all over the slopes of this mountain. 12 kilometers of climb and then 12 kilometers of descent down to the finish. Floyd Landis has showed as he knows how to go downhill very fast. But the time at the top for me is the most important time here this afternoon. This is Sastra, and at last he sees Sinkovitz, the man who rode all the way today on the wheel of Floyd Landitz. So Sastra is now climbing in second place. Well, Sastra now into second place on the road, going past Patrick Sinkovic. Sinkovic actually, Phil He's Sinkovic waiting. has been given the word, sit up and wait. We need to wait for our man, Andreas Cloden, but now it looks as if the yellow jersey decided to take the responsibility himself. As he must. An attack by Damiano Cunigo, this little rider who said he would win a mountain stage. He's left it too late, I think, but now he's got a new target, and that is the white jersey. Best newcomer to the Tour de France, and Damiano Cunigo needs just over two minutes on Marcus Foten, and we've seen Marcus drop off. But whatever happens to Floyd Landis at the finish of this race today, he has left his mark on this race. The champion is back. And Carlos Sastra, I think now, is the only man that can do anything to spoil the party. And Carlos Sastra is climbing so well and should be taking yellow tonight. Well, that's the theory, but the practice is what the clock at the finish line is going to tell us here this afternoon as Carlos Sastra looks comfortable. Damiano Cunigo has caught and passed to Christophe Moreau here. He's riding himself up possibly into the best young riders competition this afternoon. Phil, I just remembered the newspaper headline on the French newspaper the other day. They said about Floyd Landis, they said, well, he's got the yellow jersey, but there has been no panache. There's been no style, there's been no battle. I wonder what they're going to say about him tomorrow. Well, and we'll be most interested to find out because he's been the absolute hero as he goes over the top. 8C or category, outside category. Landis has done everything possible today. He's led over the Col de Colombia, the Col de Châtillon, the Col de Juplin. Now it's seven miles downhill to the finish. You know the horrible thing about the Col de Juplin is you go over that point there that shows you you've come to the summit of the King of the Mountains classification. You think you're going to start the descent immediately. Well, actually, you don't. It's level for a kilometre or so, and then it kicks up just a little bit further before you then plunge down the next 11 kilometres to the finish line. This is the third and fourth rider on the road, Christophe Moreau and Damiano Cunigo. But what's more important, I think, to us is just to keep a very close eye on the clock at the top of the Col de la Juplan. Looking backwards here is the Rabobank champion, national champion, Michael Bogart, trying to coax that rider on the left who is absolutely dying out there. That is Denny Menchoff. And look who rides past them all. The Mayo Jean picking all his rivals off who have tried daily to rob him. He just rides through them, is watching them crucify themselves and get nowhere. And watch out, you know, for Oscar Pereira, because although he's defending himself on the slopes of the climb here, he's a very good descender. We've seen him go downhill very fast in the past. He takes so many risks on one occasion. He went off the edge of the descent of the Col de la Guilibier because he was trying to have his lunch going downhill at 50 miles an hour. Today, it's a little bit different. There's something else in store for him at the end of today's stage because if he can pull back a few seconds on the descent of the Col de Juplan, he could keep himself in the yellow jersey tonight. But what a battle. Well, as we head up towards the summit of the Col de Juplan, remember Landis on the way down to his first ever stage victory in the Tour de France. He made uh, the yellow jersey a first this year as well. Bang, 5.07 is the gap for Carlos Sastra now. But it might be advantage Landis on the descent. Now the next big time check we want is the Mayo Jean. Well, this is the next man on the road, third place for the Frenchman, Christophe Moreau. And just behind him will be Damiano Cunigo, but it's a long way back to the yellow jersey. Well, the cheers will be for this Frenchman because he's done the ride of his life. Christophe Moreau coming up to date. Pity it's not Cyril Dessel, his teammate, because Cyril may be losing fourth place now. He goes over the top at five minutes and uh, 58 seconds uh, behind. The big time gap we're looking for now is that of the Mayo Jean Oscar Pereiro. Here he is as Michael Bogart stamps away up through the crowd. 
This is a bigger crowd than I've ever seen on the Col de Jou plan, almost as if they sensed that this was the deciding climb of the Tour. And you know what? It isn't going to be the case. This race will go on for the next three days. Well, we're looking here at the yellow jersey. Phil, my quick calculation on the time of Carlos Sastra, if it says 6 minutes and 57 seconds, then the yellow jersey has lost his overall lead. But that doesn't mean he'll lose it on the day because he could very easily bring something back on the descent. Michael Bogert is the man setting the tempo at the front, just ahead of Frank Schleck, just ahead of the yellow jersey. I'm looking at the clock to see what the time is going to be when they stop it on the line. And they stop it there on about 6.52, so the yellow jersey is still in the yellow jersey for only a handful of seconds. As Floyd Landis continues to dive down this mountain as fast as he can go, he's on the lower slopes now. Soon he'll be shooting into the town of Morsi. We have a little different approach these days. He's taking lists, though. He wants every second. Every second is going to count. Michael Rogers today sacrifices Hink's place in the top ten overall to try and keep Andreas Cloden up there. Maybe T-Mobile should have thought about looking after Michael Rogers because Cloden really has not been up to the mark. Michael Rogers will zip up the jersey now for the journey down. Like everybody else, he thinks he's about to go downhill there, but there's a small climb to come. We are into Morsi now. These people have watched this escape all day today on a large screen. Watch these corners because we don't want nothing to ruin a perfect day for Floyd Landis. The man is back. Whatever he is tonight in the Tour de France, he is one of the great riders of this race once again. Well, this is one of the most incredible performances I've seen. It's fine letting a guy like Richard Viron get away on a stage like this because you know he's not going to win the Tour de France. But inside of the final kilometre now for Floyd Landis, two left-hand bends, he'll drop down here about 400 metres, he'll face another left-hand bend, and it's a slight drag up towards the finish line of what's going to be in Port Phil. Look at the way he's sprinting, he's not even cruising, he's not going to enjoy this Every victory until he crosses counts. the line. Every second counts. He's racing to the line like a man who's just moved off the front of the peloton. He has not cracked today. He's done everything right. He's used that water to its fullest. He's looking for the line when the clock will start, and it will see him come from the depths of 11th up probably into the top four riders today, but we don't know until the other riders come off the Jeux plan. Look at this crowd here. It's one of the biggest of the tour. They've lined this road for the last 24 kilometres, and they've lined it four people deep. Well, they have seen and witnessed something this afternoon which is going to be talked about for many years in the sport of cycling, for many years in the history of the Tour de France, and still, Phil, he will not give up. He will keep powering all the way to the line because every second now is going to count for Floyd Landis from San Diego. Floyd Landis comes home, his first ever stage win in his fifth Tour de France. He's had three yellow jerseys this week, but he hasn't never dreamt he'd get another one, and now he's made it possible before the finish in Paris to win this race. That's a, a nice show of determination, a magnificent piece of revenge. The clock has started now as Landis gets off his bike like he's about to deliver the newspaper. Well, what a ride through the Alps that was for Floyd Landis here this afternoon, Phil. I could not believe that he was going to survive on a day like this. We had a great insight from his coach, Robbie Ventura, who felt confident that Floyd was able to do that. The clock has stopped started on the finish line we've been at around about 30 seconds since he crossed the line but what's going to be important is where is everybody else in the tour de france this afternoon this is one of the monumental battles i think we have both ever witnessed so many riders have been just that equal on ability floyd landis has come down the mountain across the alps today just in the style of a Hannibal of modern times. An incredible performance. I can't believe we're talking now. Floyd Landis back in the race. He started the day eight minutes and eight seconds behind. He ended the race in tears yesterday, a complete disaster. And to his total credit, he never made an excuse. He just simply said he had a bad day. He didn't blame his team. He didn't blame anybody but himself. He came out in angry mood today to put the record books right. And there's been a crash and down Moreau has gone went to down. Sell. On the way down, the Jeux plan. Well, I'm surprised it's only caught one rider out, but at least he's OK. And this will be and a nasty tumble there, too, by Cyril Dessel. These are desperate times in the Tour de France. He's fourth overall, and he's fighting to keep it. 5.07 at the top of the climb. Sastre has lost time on the descent. They might be crucial seconds for the time trial when that comes up a day after tomorrow, because Landis has made an incredible descent here. 
5.07 it was, he's taken 30 seconds and counting, he has taken the best part of a minute of Sastra on the way down the mountain, and that could be absolutely crucial in winning the Tour de France. 5.41 I reckon it was. Well, I make his girl have an advantage of about 20 seconds ahead of Floyd Landis in the overall classification. Christophe Moreau is going to be the next rider home, but then we've got to do another calculation between Sastra and, of course, Oscar Pereiro. Well, the battle now primarily is between Sastra and Pereiro for who wears yellow tomorrow. Will it be Pereiro who keeps it? He's a very good descender. It looks as though Sastra hasn't given all on that descent because Landis pulled out an extra 35 seconds on him. Here comes Damiano Cunego, the Italian, who probably tonight will be the new leader in the best rookie competition in his first Tour de France. Up and down, this Tour de France has been over three weeks. I've just made a quick calculation, Phil, because of the 12-second time bonus, Carlos Sastra needs to wait a minute and 38 seconds to see the arrival of Oscar Pereira. If Oscar Pereira doesn't come in within one 38 seconds of his time, then there's going to be a change in the yellow jersey tonight. And Floyd Landis is going to be third. Well, he's going to make it, Paul, because he's coming in with a sprint. I think this man has kept it. He needs to be around 7-11, I think it is. 7-11, 7-18. And he's sprinting to the line. And this time, I think Oscar, the big surprise, who has given that breakaway of a half an hour, he doesn't care who wins this sprint. It's same time finish. It is going to be desperate. The seconds are there. But this time, Oscar, they're in your favour. You still lead the top to France and we're talking four or five seconds. Floyd Landis, though, was talking minutes. 5 minutes 42, the margin of his win over Carlos Sastre, the only contender for overall victory in the top six of the stage. In seventh was the yellow jersey of Oscar Pereiro, seven minutes and eight seconds behind Landis, with Andreas Clerden one spot back in the same time. Can Evans lost seven minutes 20, he was tenth, four seconds ahead of Dennis Menchoff. Cyril Dessel came in 16th, 8 minutes 49 down after his fall on the final descent. Michael Rogers lost 12 minutes 34 in 22nd place. Well, not so much a celebration as an angry gesture of vindication from Landis as he crossed the line. He still looked like a man with aggression to work off as he was walked to the back of the podium. He switched to the stand of Winner Smile by the time he took the top step, knowing that astonishingly, given where he was in the morning, he was now favourite to occupy the same step in Paris. Ned spoke to him. I spoke to you this morning and you said, I'm going to attack. Could you have, could you have ever known that it would work out like that? I hoped it would work. I know I'm stronger than I looked yesterday, and I don't know if it worked that well, but usually after two mountain stages, people are pretty tired and not so organized, so uh, worked as well as I could have hoped. Touching distance of the Tour de France now, touching distance. Thank you very much. And there's the reason Floyd was grinning so widely. He was up from 11th to 3rd and had cut his deficit from an impossible 8 minutes 8 seconds to a menacing half a minute. Oscar Pereiro still had the race lead by 12 seconds from Carlos Sastre, but neither of them could time trial like the American. Andreas Clerden could, but he was 2 minutes 29 down in 4. Cad Evans and Dennis Menshoff were just hoping for places on the podium in Paris. Well, the question of the day was why the so-called contenders for overall victory in this race let Floyd Landis build up such a massive lead before the orders went out to collaborate on a chase. This from CSC's Bjarne Reese was the closest we got to an answer. You left it a long time before you sent your boys to the front. Why was that? Well, I th thought we had the situation under control and uh, it looked okay. And I felt it was not up to us to, to take the lead. And uh, well, then I, then I saw that uh, Kestepan, they, they would give it away. And then, I, then we took the lead. But uh, I didn't expect that Landis was so strong on the last climb. Well, at the start of the day, he'd looked like pulling off one of the most unlikely overall victories in Tour de France history. By the end of it, he'd become the victim of one of the most unlikely returns from the dead. The best that could be said of a bad day for Oscar Pereiro was that he was still in yellow. Oscar, congratulations for holding on to the yellow jersey. You did very bravely today. Yes, he's happy because it's too much uh, difficult winner the tour. I I think it's in the recuperation today. Can you do more? The podium is that enough for you? Oh yes, good. 